So this presentation is about Shawliullah Muhaddath Dailvi Rahtullahi, his life and his mission. He was born in 1703, passed away in 1762 which means he lived for a period of only 59 years. But um, like all of our predecessors, our Salaf al-Salihin, one of the things we know about all of them is that even if they were given very short life in this world, the amount of work that they were able to get done in that short time uh, was phenomenal and would be equal to the work of hundreds of scholars in our time. Uh, the reason for that is their level of sincerity, their connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their ruhaniya, and a host of other things, which we're not going to talk about because we'll be getting off the topic. Shawliullah Muhaddath Dailwi Rahmatullahi is a very important icon, especially for the Indian subcontinent. At large for the Islamic world, but especially for the Indian subcontinent. Every Muslim from Bangladesh, from Pakistan, from India must know Shawliullah Muhaddath Dailwi because all of us owe him our deen and our iman. And I know this is a very, very big claim that I'm making. <clears throat> But the more you learn about Shawlila Muhaddath Delvi and what he was able to accomplish, what we, he was able to achieve and how he was able to stop the onslaught of kufr that had already almost completely destroyed and eradicated the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Indian subcontinent, you would understand why I am making this claim. If it wasn't for Shawlila Muhaddath Delvi, Specifically, I could say almost for sure that most of us, our forefathers from the Indian subcontinent, uh, even if we were Muslim, we would be compromised Muslims. And what I mean by compromised, I'm going to under explain that a little by, while later in more detail. But what I basically mean by saying compromise is that our deen would have been incomplete because we would have been believers in Allah and His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam but at the same time we would be also okay with different forms of shirk, different forms of polytheistic rituals and practices. Had it not been for Shawliullah Rahmatullahi Muhaddath Delwi um, who introduced the deen of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in its original state as it was revealed upon Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Indian subcontinent, the likelihood is that many of us may no longer have been Muslims because our forefathers would no longer have been Muslims. If you look at Shawlila Muhaddath Delvi Rahmatullah Ali's life, it's very comparable to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born in a pagan culture Shawlillah Muhaddath Delwi was born in a pagan culture. In fact, more than a pagan culture, a pantheist culture, which is even more dangerous than a pagan culture. And we'll talk about that in some more detail, inshallah, later. Uh, he faced the same struggles Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did. Exact same struggles. And the most important, he used the same method Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did in order to bring the deen back into the Indian subcontinent. So what does this whole presentation comprise of? There's some notes that I've made just for the beginning session, the, for the beginning part of this presentation. So we have kind of a general idea of how to navigate this presentation and where we're going with it, because sometimes we may get lost, okay? Um, and I want to make sure that everyone is with me and on track 
And so I just want to kind of give you a, a brief kind of uh, summary of the presentation and what it's all about. So if you ever study Shaulilla Muhaddath Delvi, read books about him or his books uh, in Farsi or translations of his books, one thing you'll notice about the books that have been written about him, whether it's through his biographers or scholars that speak about him, uh, you'll see that the studies and books on the life of Shaulilla focus extensively on the intellectual, intellectual aspect of his life, his reforms, his writings. And so as I was going through different uh, books as I was getting prepared for this presentation, what I noticed was that everyone was focusing a lot on his intellectuality. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him with a deep insight. So you read his book, Hujjatul al-Baligha, which is his masterpiece, like it's world renowned um, in the Islamic world as one of the best books in this explaining the holistic nature of Islam. Uh, but it focuses almost exclusively on the intellectual greatness of Shauli Allah it does not focus on the fundamental change and contribution that he was able to bring into the Indian subcontinent that was able to change the tide of the Muslims towards Haq, towards Deen, towards Sunnah, towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That fundamental change is what I'm going to focus on. I'm not going to focus on the intellectual aspect of his life, his reforms that he uh, proposed social economic reforms, um, his writings, his letters to different groups of people. He wrote letters to the princes, the royal family, the military, because um, there was corruption everywhere. So he was trying to address everyone. He was talking to the ulama of his time. He was talking to the Sufis of his time. He was talking to uh, the king of his time. So his writings are are wide and vast and include a lot of different things. We don't want to get into that because that would really be going off of the essence of his life. What was his main contribution? What was the fundamental thing that he offered to the Muslims in the Indian subcontinent that made him a mujaddid of his time, a reformer of his time? There's almost a unanimous uh, or a, 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 a consensus on the fact that he was a mujaddid of his time. He was a reformer, he revived the deen, he broke the ropes that were tying the deen down and stopping it from thriving and growing and developing into um, uh, what it's supposed to be, into a full Islamic system, a sharia system, uh, where the human being, the Muslim is a khalifatun fil ard. So, that's the one first thing that I want to uh, address is that this whole presentation is not about the intellectual aspect of his life, okay? His propositions, his letters, his writings, his reforms. I'm going to focus more on the essence where I saw he brought the biggest change. As we mentioned, he was a mujaddid. All mujaddids like the prophets emerged in the most corrupt times. And then as a note, I mentioned the miracle of this Ummah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So let's go back to, uh, let's take the name of any one of the Mujaddids of our previous centuries, Ibn Taymiyyah, for example, okay? Let's look at um, Hafiz Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani. Some may not consider him a Mujaddid, but he was a great Muhaddith. Um, Ibn Qayyim al-Jawzi, rahmatullahi alayhi. Um, Alama ibn Jawzi, rahmatullahi alayhi, uh, you had uh, Mujaddad al-Fithani, rahmatullahi alayhi, Sarhindi. Um, so you go back at any period in time and you pick up any, any Mujaddad of his time and you'll find that the Mujaddad was born and raised in one of the most corrupt times. If you look at, and it starts with the tradition of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam um, was receiving the prophethood, what was the situation of the Arabs at the time? We all know what the situation was, was like. It was extremely corrupt, extremely decadent, extremely immoral. 
Um, and there is corruption everywhere in every aspect, socially, spiritually, politically. So the mujaddids who are the revivers of the deen are always placed in the exact same situation, in the exact same circumstances. They're always born and raised in that same culture. But the beauty of these people, of the mujaddids is, is that because they're chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to revive the ummah, they don't get dirty or soiled by the muck and filth of the culture. In fact, they're more pure than a person who comes from a pure culture, even while these mujaddids are born and raised in a very filthy, corrupt, decadent, and immoral culture and society. And that's the miracle of this Ummah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That if you go back before the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whenever any nation faced any type of fitna, they would get so bogged down by the fitna that they were never able to rise again. Just take the example of Christianity. The minute Isa Alayhi Salatu Salam left, immediately after chaos broke out, right? And there was a difference of opinion between okay, is Jesus Christ God and human at the same time? Or is he just human? Or is he half God? Have, and there was just like kind of dogmatic uh, differences of opinion between uh, in, the, in, the, in the Christian dogma that they couldn't come to a, a, a agreement on anything. And as a result, there was civil war. And then there was the Council of Nicaea or Nicaea, whatever it's called, that took place uh, to settle that situation but the thing is is that the first fitna came and they couldn't handle it here in our ummah fitnas upon fitna come and despite those fitnas and how severe they are you see a person rising from within that fitna and he's completely pure unadulterated unsoiled uh, by that fitna and then he changes the whole society. He changes the whole culture. And that's the nature of a mujaddid. That's what a mujaddid does. They are not people who just come about doing things on their own. They are chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because in normal circumstances, there's no person that does not get influenced or affected by their culture and society. It's impossible. But the mujaddids were different. Okay? Something for us to remember. Number three, connecting us to the transmission in the, is the fundamental goal of every reformer. Okay, what does it mean by transmission? So our deen is all based on sanad. Whoever is connected to that sanad is connected to the deen. Whoever is not connected to the sanad or the transmission is not connected to the deen. Okay, so the whole idea of the reformers was they noticed that that connection with the transmission is gone or it has weakened to a great extent, and they needed to revive that connection with the transmission. In fact, they even wanted to include, bring people into the transmission so that they become also transmitters of that knowledge. How does that transmission begin? It begins with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then with, from him to Jibreel salam, from him to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and it's a continuous link, chain link, uh, that goes all the way to our times. Okay, that chain link has been continuing and will continue until the day of judgment. Whoever is connected to that transmission will be saved. Whoever disconnects is going to go astray. Okay. Now, in that respect, reformers see that there is a disconnect between the ummah and between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the Sahaba, which is the first three links of this chain of transmission. When they see that, then they know what they have to do in order to bring, to revive the ummah and bring it back to its original state on the fitrah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, on the fitrah of the deen of Islam, which is the pristine nature upon which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this deen. And then you have the last part, how institutions made this ummah. This is a very important part of understanding um, 
the life of Shaulillah Muhaddad Delhi. So if you look at the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, you'll find that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam actually spent very little time outside of Medina Munawwara once he had migrated to Medina Munawwara outside of the expeditions that he joined and led to different parts. Khaybar he went to, Tabuk he went to, um, he went to, uh, well, Khandak happened in Medina Munawwara. Um, where else did he go? Muraysia, uh and Hunain, right after the uh, conquest of Makkah Mukarma. But outside of that, outside of his ghazawat, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam devoted almost his whole life after the hijrah to only one thing establishing an institution in Medina Munawwara for producing people who would go out and spread the deen after he had left this world so this included the sahaba sufa this included all the sahaba ridwan allah who were there with him all the time he was holding gatherings night and day um, he was there with them they were recording everything he was saying he was doing through their observations through their experiences with him Okay, that Medina Munawwara, the whole city, what became a Darul Ulum, an institution where he was producing students of the deen, seekers of the deen who would go out, graduate from this place, and go on to spread the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, now we find that all of our greatest scholars, it didn't matter whether they were muhaddithun or they were fuqaha or they were mujaddid, they all followed the same example of Rasulullah's life. They didn't move around from place to place, except when they were in the process of learning. So Imam Bukhari, once he was in the process of learning, and now he'd graduated into the second stage of actual teacher, then Imam Bukhari settled down, although he had to move once or twice because of circumstances. And he had his gatherings, and thousands and thousands of people attended those gatherings. And that's where he taught his hadith, and that's how Bukhari came together as the first authentic book of hadith. Okay. Likewise, you go to Imam Abu Hanifa, he settled down in Kufa, and um, he stayed with his teacher, Hamad bin Abi Sulaiman, for 18 years. Uh, then he took his place once he passed away, and then he produced scholars. Not moving around from here and there, just being in his masjid and teaching the knowledge of the deen in his, in that masjid for his, almost his whole life. You find that Shawriullah Muhaddad Delwi to bring the changes that he needed to bring. And these were massive, humongous changes that he needed to bring. This is about changing hearts. You know, changing jobs is easy. Changing people is easy. Okay. Dropping down buildings and building new ones is easy. Changing hearts, starting up a movement of change of hearts is, is very, very difficult. It's almost impossible. We get tired when we're trying to explain something to somebody and they don't listen, they don't understand, we get sick of them. Imagine changing a whole group of people, a whole nation of people. How did he go about doing it? Shaulullah embraced the tradition of establishing an institution. So now we're going to start with a little bit of his biography. So I mentioned he was born in 1703. He passed away in 1962. Okay. What did he do most of his life? There was a madrasa in New Delhi. At that time, it was not New Delhi. It was just Delhi, which is now the capital of India. Okay. At that time, it was the capital of the Mughal Empire and of the Muslims. Um. Would, he had a madrasa there that was established by his father, founded by his father. He stayed there for almost, let's see, 19, uh, sorry, 1732 to 1762. Okay. 1732 to 1762. How many years is that? Like 30 years? So about 30 years, he spent his life in that institution, in that madrasa, doing only one thing, one thing that he thought was necessary to remove the problems that we're going to be talking about up ahead. And to destroy those influences that were 
still that are still existing, by the way, to this day. We see them to this day. You go to Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, you'll still see those things happening to this day. They're very prominent and they still dominate the society, but not all the way. Alhamdulillah, Allah Ta'ala has saved most of the Muslims from the Indian subcontinent from these things through the barakah and the blessings and the hard work and mission of Shaulullah Muhammad Delvi Rahmatullahi and his progeny and his spiritual students. Okay. But what he did was he just taught the ahadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's all he did for 32 years. All the changes he brought were essentially from him teaching at the Sahai Sitta, the six books of hadith, to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of students, year after year after year after year, and then sending them out, go, 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 all over the Indian subcontinent, go and teach the hadith. Why did he do that? Inshallah, we'll talk about that. So now, let's go through a short timeline of Shaulillah Muhaddith Delvi Rahmatullahi. So we get to know him a little bit better. All right. So 1703, as we mentioned, he was born in the home of Shah Abdul Rahim, who was one of the authors of Fatawa al Ghiri and also a descendant of Umar Farooq radiallahu anhu. So Shaulillah was Faruqi, a descendant of Umar Farooq radiallahu anhu. Um, his father's name was Shah Abdul Rahim. Now, Shah Abdul Rahim Rahmatullahi, uh, played a very important role in the life of Shah Abdullah because he was his main teacher for teaching him all the main sciences uh, for the understanding the Quran and the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But he didn't teach him much about hadith. He didn't teach him much hadith. And we'll talk about why he didn't teach him that much hadith later on okay right now we need to know that he was his main teacher okay and Shah Abdul Rahim Rahmatullahi was a great faqih a jurist of the Hanafi fiqh now we're talking about an era which was this was the Mughal Empire and when he was born these were the last years of the one of the greatest Mughal emperors whose name was Aurangzeb Alamgir. He's the only, and I'm going to repeat this, and I want you to remember it, note it down. He is the only Orthodox Sunni Muslim amongst all the Mughal emperors that existed, that lived, that ran the Mughal Empire from the 15th century all the way up to the 19th century. The only Orthodox Sunni Muslim. I know that most of us think, when we think Mughal Empire, we're thinking Islamic Empire. It was not an Islamic Empire. You will find out why later on. It was not an Islamic Empire. But there was one person who, and I've read many books by non-Muslim, mostly British historians about the Mughal Empire, and they all unanimously, almost unanimously, hate, despise, condemn Aurangzeb Alamgir Rahmatullahi because he was the only staunch 100% Sunni Muslim. And he stood for the haqq. But he was very weak against the powers that existed in that time, which Shah Ali was able to combat, confront, and defeat, subhanAllah, through his institution of Madrasa Rahimiyah, teaching there for 30 years, from 1732 to 1762. What Aurangzeb Alamgir was not able to accomplish, Shah Ali was able to accomplish. And, and the reason I try to emphasize this is because we need to understand the importance of Madaris. Madaris. These are the focal points, the foundation, the fortresses of the Deen of Islam. You don't have these fortresses in your communities. Your communities are not going to last very long. Circuit speakers is not a tradition that ever existed in our ummah. It's not a tradition that existed in our ummah. We don't hear about it amongst the Sahaba that you had people just go from one place to another and just speaking, speaking, speaking. Okay? That's not how the deen spreads. 
you have to have a vantage point, a strong point where you stand and you can see everything. That strong point is when you establish an institution, okay? And I want you to go back in history. Just look at Islamic history yourself. Read through it and you'll find all the greatest scholars were produced in institutions, okay? They're all produced in institutions, whether they're Hafiz ibn Hajar, whether it was uh, your Imam Ghazali, okay? Now, when we say institution, we mean not necessarily institutions and the building a whole bunch of uh, teachers there. It could be one teacher and a whole bunch of students. But that teacher is there and he's not going anywhere. Everybody knows you want to study this subject. This is where you go. Okay. This is what Shah Ali was able to accomplish because of establishing that tradition. He knew this is the only way to go. Aurangzeb Alamdi Rahmatullahi was a great, as I mentioned, Sunni Orthodox Muslim and emperor. He was very, very humble. And everybody recognizes all that. But the reason they don't like him and the reason they call him, the term that they often use for Aurangzeb Alamdi is bigoted. They call him bigoted. Was because he was very strict on the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Very strict on the idea that there's only one Allah and there's a disti distinction between the creator and the creation. And that distinction is that we are creation and he is the creator. This is the essential distinction between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that establishes the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're going to go into that into more detail about that later. You'll understand more about what I'm talking about. I'm kind of philosophizing right now. But anyways, Aurangzeb Alamgir was the person who started up this whole program, okay, to collect all the fatwas about any topic related to daily life and to put it all together. So for that, he collected all these scholars from all over the Indian subcontinent, the best scholars, the best fuqaha, okay? And one of them was the father of Shawriullah. So he is one of the authors of that compilation that came together under the auspicious of uh, Aurangzeb Alamgir. And that's why that whole compilation of Fatawa is known as Fatawa Alamgiri, named after Aurangzeb Alamgir. Okay. So, but Shah Abdul Rahim was the, uh, one of the authors uh, of Fatawa Alamgiri, amongst the many other others who also took part in putting all these fatwas together. Okay. Going on. 1707, Aurangzeb Alamgir, the only Orthodox Muslim emperor who commissioned the writing of Fatawa Alamgiri, passes away. So only, that means Shaudi Rahmatullahi was only four years old when Aurangzeb Alamgir Rahmatullahi passed away. Now this is important to remember because Aurangzeb Alamgir Rahmatullahi was the last effective Mughal emperor. After him, the Mughal emperors either were assassinated or they fell into fitna of wine and women and luxury and that kind of stuff, or they were um, became puppets of other powers. And the last one, Bahadur Shah Zafar was the last of the Mughal emperors he also became a puppet of the British um, because by his time, the British had completely dismantled the Mughal Empire and taken over the whole country except for the city of Delhi itself. And that was only, you could say, just ceremonial that they're keeping him for the sake of uh, just appeasing the Muslim masses and the native masses, I should say, Muslim and Hindu population, who all respected and revered the Mughal emperor. Okay, so Aurangzeb Alamgir was the only emperor of the Mughal empire who, <coughs> who ran the empire for over, I think, 45 years. And the other one was his great-grandfather, Akbar, who was known as Akbar the Great by most histor non-Muslim historians. But he was, of course... Uh, if he was great to the British, then you know he must have been really, really corrupt. And he was. Um, he was a complete opposite of Aurangzeb Alamgir. So it's important for us to know because Aurangzeb Alamgir tried to bring change. He wasn't able to do it. But the effects of his, of his kingdom 
and his uh, rule uh, had a strong influence on Shah Ulam Muhaddad Dil bin Abdullah and allowed him to progress and develop in his deen the way he needed to. <clears throat> 1721, his father passes away. He's 17 years old, okay? 17, 18 years old, somewhere on there. He begins to teach at Father's Mother Sarahimiya, which was founded, as we mentioned earlier, by his father in Delhi. Now, I don't say New Delhi. The reason is, uh, if you read the history of the Indian subcontinent, you know that when the British, there was a mutiny that took place in 1857. It's called the Sepoy Mutiny. And you may have read in your social studies books, if, you were, if it ever came up about India, they mentioned the 1857 Sepoy Mutiny. Okay? That Sepoy Mutiny, basically the 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 native populations um, that were uh, soldiers working under the British, they led an uprising against the British. And when the British decided to take revenge, the way they took revenge was they completely flattened and leveled the whole city of Delhi. Flattened it completely, except for two places. Number one was the Red Fort, must, Red Fort which is still existing today. And number two was the Lal Masjid, which was also still existing. Today. Everything else was wiped out, including, by the way, Mother Sarahimiya. Mother Sarahimiya was gone, khalas. In 1857, long after uh, Shauli Lahmatullah had passed away and his progeny had been passed away, Mother Sarahimiya was gone because it was in the inner part of, uh, the old part of the Delhi city. And that part had been completely wiped out in 1857 when they killed thousands and thousands and thousands of Muslims after um, the mutiny. And they were able to take control over the city of Delhi. So father passes away. He begins to teach at father's mother Sarahimiya in Delhi from 1721. 1732, something very important happened. Okay. And this is very important for us to know is that he travels to Haramain and studies under the shiuch of the two holy cities for two years. Why does he travel to Haramain? And why did he not gain all the knowledge and acquire all the knowledge that he need to from the Indian subcontinent? We will talk about that, inshallah. At that time, I want you to keep a note. And this time, I want you to keep a note of this date of 1732 and the fact that he migrated, well, not migrated, he traveled to uh, Makkah Makarma and Medina Munawwara and stayed there for roughly 14 months. The rest of the six months were in traveling back and forth because in those days they traveled by, by ship and so it took a long time to go and to come back. So it was two years altogether, but it was actually 14 months in which he was able to perform two hajj as well. And those were the only two hajj that he ever performed in his lifetime. Last but not least is 1762. So he taught six books of hadith until his death in Madrasa Rahimiya. Okay, so we're going to have to make a little bit of a correction. I had mentioned that he was in Madrasa Rahimiya from 1732, it was actually 1721. But we do have to remove from that two years, and that's the two years where he was in Makkah Mukarma or on his way to Makkah Mukarma and back. So 21 to 62, um, my mistake, my apologies. I just want you to count the years. How much is that all together? 41 years. Okay, so for 41 years. So that's four decades. He was teaching um, the hadith. What I don't know, and it's not clear in his history book, the history books about him and the biographies about him, is that whether he was teaching hadith from 1721 to 32, while he was in Madrasa Rahima, was he teaching hadith at that time or was it when he returned? To me, from what I understand is, is that from 1732 to 1762, for sure, he was teaching hadith. But from 1721 to 1732, he was just teaching the different ancillary sciences uh, that were are related to understanding of Quran. So now, for example, Nahav, Sarf, Ilmul Balagha, Ilmul Badi, and those other sciences that are secondary to the uh, fundamental sciences of the Quran Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Going on, important facts about Shaudi Allah that we need to know. Okay. He was exiled with family from Delhi by the Amir of Delhi. So in the last era of the Mughal Empire, 
as I mentioned, Aurangzeb al Anqili's time period was the last period of the happy days of the Mughal Empire. After that, it was the degenerating decadence and corruption had settled in. Um, a lot of the Mughal emperors were just drunk all the time, intoxicated into their, you know, now all sorts of bad things. Okay. Um, and so during that time, one of the governors or the Amir, as they call them, of or mayor, you want to say it, mayor of Delhi at that time was a man named Najaf Khan, who was a Shiite. Okay, he was a Shiite. And he hated Shawulullah because of the work that he was doing. Uh, so what did he do? He broke his wrists. He called his soldiers in. They went to Shawulullah Muhaddis Delvi Rahmatullahi and they actually physically broke his wrist so that he would never able to never be able to write books again. Then he was also, this was only the first of persecutions. The second thing that Najaf Khan did was he exiled him and his family and his children from the city of Delhi. And they were not allowed to sit on any transport. So they had camels or horses. You can take your camels and horses, but you can't ride on them. And that he did to humiliate them and to make them as much as suffer that make them suffer as much as he could. Um, and these are the things we don't know about our great predecessors. All our predecessors went through a lot of hardship. Okay. Imam Shafi Ramtulali, Imam Munifa Ramtulali was killed. Look at Umar Farooq Radhiallahu. Forget about our predecessors. Look at Sahaba. Had Umar Radhiallahu was shaheed. Had Uthman Radhiallahu was martyred and assassinated. Had Ali Radhiallahu was assassinated. Right? Imam Munifa was poisoned to death. Imam Shafi was uh, fla uh, flogged. Imam Malik Ramtulali was flogged. Um, even many of the other Sahaba during the time of Umayyah had to go through a lot of difficulties. Okay, Ibn Taymiyyah, he died in a prison. So this is nothing new. When you follow the path of deen and you revive the deen, you have to face a lot of hardship. Okay, so I mean, don't think about becoming a Mujandid, honestly. I mean, not that it's going to make a difference because Mujandid are chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But I mean, even if you thought it was, you know, something I want to do, you know, I want to pursue this big, glorious, um, you know, goal of becoming a Mujadda. Just remember, it comes with a big package of a lot of hardship. Uh, that's why Allah SWT doesn't just make anybody a Mujadda. Only those who can handle it. All right. All his major works and writings are from the period after his return from Haramain. So if you go back to the previous slide, we mentioned that he went to Haramain in 1732 all the way to 1732 all the way to, uh, what was it? I said two years, right? So 1732 to 1734, those two years. Um, once he came back, that's when major changes started coming in him, okay? Major changes. Not that he was like less good before, it's just that now he was armed. Because now that he went to the Haram, Haramain, he actually got to sit in the gatherings of a hadith to learn Quran and the Sunnah of Rasulullah the way he needed to, the way he was thirsting for. Okay. And when he came back, his students from his previous, meaning prior to his going, they were um, so impressed amazed, flabbergasted by the change that had come in him. Because if you look at his writings, he has many writings, all his writings that he did, okay, all the books that he's written and authored, all come after the period of 1732. Nothing is before. Nothing. And that's why I said, I'm, I'm almost 100% sure that he only started teaching a hadith, the Sahai Sitta, after 1732 in Madrasa Rahimiyah, not before. Because he was only able to get a 
sanad of hadith from um, the Haramain after he went and not before. And tell them he didn't have the sanad of hadith. In fact, the Indian subcontinent was lacking in muhaddithun, was lacking in all the main sciences. There were nobody there. Indian subcontinent was completely a desert in terms of muhaddithun. A desert. Here and there, yes. Here and there, yes. But they all struggle. They all struggle. So the author of, for example, Ganzul Ammal, right? Don't remember his name. He was from, I think, Hyderabad, somewhere down south. I mean, so you have those occasional cases, but it was very, very rare. If you wanted to learn hadith, Shah Abdul Aziz says, Mawla Abdul Hayy Laknibi in his book says, I'm going to give those references later. They all said you had to leave the Indian subcontinent. Can you imagine what the effect of that was? The fact that there was nobody to teach hadith. You're looking for somebody to teach you hadith. Somebody to teach you Quran. People didn't even have access to Quran Kareem because most people didn't speak Arabic. They spoke Persian. And there was no translation of Quran in Persian. So they didn't, they read the Quran, but they didn't know what they were reading. They didn't understand the meaning, the basic meaning even. So people didn't have access to the Quran and the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is one of the major contributions that he needed to make. And he knew why he needed to make them. And we're going to talk about that, inshallah, later if we get a chance. Shah Abdul Aziz, his son, he had four sons. Shah Rafiuddin, Shah Abdul Qadir, Shah Abdul Aziz, and Shah Abdul Ghani. And these are the four people who continued his transmission of his teachings, of his movement, of his mission to spread, propagate, use the knowledge of the hadith throughout the Indian subcontinent. Darlum Dioband is one of the flowers of that transmission. Is one of the flowers of that transmission. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted that flower and its fragrance spread throughout the world. Therefore, you see Darlum Diobands all over the world. And scholars from Darlum Dioban all over the world, we are all essentially those of us who have studied from madrasas that are associated with Dioban or the Dioban thought and teachings are basically just representatives of Shawri Allah Muhammad Daily. This is why it's more important for us, those of us who are associated with Darlum Dioban, to know who Shawri Allah was because Shawri Allah is the essence of who we are. He defines us. Okay. So Shah Abdul Aziz said, those who benefited from before did not find him to be the same after his return. This is his quote. I'm going to give the references later. His mission formed two main groups in the Indian subcontinent to propagate the deen and defend against the pantheist ideologies. What is pantheism and what is the ideologies of pantheism? We'll talk about that later. These two groups were, and I'm being all honest, even though I'm not with the other group, um, but these are the two groups that formed out of Shauri Larahtulare's efforts. One was Darlum Dioband, and number two was this group known as the Ahli Hadith that came later on. Um, there's an essential difference between the two. We're going to talk about that difference later. And that also relates to Shauri La Muhaddath Delwi's mission and his objectives. Okay. Last but not least, he taught six books of Hadith until death in Madrasa Rahimiya, which as I mentioned, was leveled and flattened during and after the mutiny. Now, what was the, what was the time of Shawli Allah like, politically speaking, socially speaking? So, I won't mention how it was socially so much, but I think we can gather from the political strife and the anarchy that reigned in that time, we could understand what the social um, situation was in the time of Shawli Allah Muhaddath Delhi. Okay. Um, it was a really bad time. So bad that Shawli Allah actually sent a letter to 
the king of Afghanistan at that time to please, he begged him, attack, please attack India, attack the subcontinent. Why? Because the Mughal Empire had become so weak, so fragile, that at one time where it controlled hundreds and hundreds of miles, now literally it was controlling only miles. Only the city of Delhi and maybe a little bit more. All the enemies of the Muslims were slowly rising up and rebelling. The sick, they were rebelling. And they were, the sick were rebelling in Punjab and they were boiling with blood against Muslims. And Shah Abdul Aziz talks about in detail how they would, uh, and I'm speaking literally, boil Muslims on pots of hot oil. How Ranjit Singh, who was the leader of the Sikh rebellion, how he would rape Muslim women, not on bed, not in the streets, while he was sitting on his elephant in the palanquin. Like he was so shameless. And he did it only to humiliate Muslims. Converted Masajid, okay, in Punjab, especially in Lahore, into stables. These well-known facts, historical facts. The Marathas, another, it was an ethnic group, Indian Hindu group. Maharashtra is a state right now in present-day India that's named after the people of uh, Maharashtra who are the Marathis, okay? There was a Marathi rebellion, okay? And then there was Nadir Shah that came in from Iran. I mean, it was total chaos. And Shaulullah Ramtulali, it's really, really like impossible to even understand how he was able to do all these writings and have all these books and send out all these letters as if he was living, living in total calm when all this anarchy and all this corruption, all this chaos was taking place in his time. Like literally the time 1739, it's going to come in this little timeline here. 1739, Nadir Shah came from Iran. Okay. He sacked the city of Delhi. He killed almost half the population of Delhi. Half the population. Like piles of corpses on the sides, strewn in the middle of the road, everywhere. And Shaulullah happened to be in Delhi at the time. But if you read his books, you read his letters, you don't get that inkling that he was living in that type of a time, okay? So within his time, at least seven to eight Mughal emperors ruled one after the other. They were either puppets, they were assassinated, they were killed. The first one of them was Bahadur Shah. Then 1730, you have Jahandar Shah. Then you have Farukh 1717, 1719, you have Rafi darajat okay? Shah Jahan II, 1719. Same year, literally look at 1719, 1719. So that means Rafiud Darajat probably was six months max, eight months. Nadir Shah sacks Delhi, 1739. Okay, I'm not mentioning a lot of details in between. The Sikh rebellion also happened in the time, Marathi rebellion happened at the time. Mughal Empire had crumbled, had crumbled into very, very small pieces. Now everybody was just for himself. Those who were left in the Mughal Empire were just trying to get the best pieces of the pie, whatever's left of the Mughal Empire, and just keep it for themselves. Nobody was trying to actually uh, help support and uh, bring the Mughal Empire back to its old glory. Okay, 1748, Muhammad Shah. All this is happening. And then you have 1754 is Ahmad Shah Bahadur. And then you have Alamgir. In Alamgir II, sorry, in 1759, and 1760, Shah Jahan III, and then 1765, as we mentioned, he died. In 1762, three years later, the Battle of Plassey took place. It's very important because the Battle of Plassey was the battle between Lord Clive, who was a representative of the East India Company, against 
uh, the Muslim Nawab of Calcutta, I believe. I don't know exactly. But he beat him. And he beat him because there were some people, traitors, betrayers from within the Muslim ranks that uh, let out important information to Clive and because that he was able to win. And that was the first step the East India Company and the British Empire was able to take inside the Indian subcontinent. Thereafter, they ran the country all the way until the independence of India and Pakistan from the British in 1940. Hmm. Was it 45 or 47? One of the two. Anyhow, going back, let's read the situation. And I'm, I'm most of my, by the way, most of my, uh, most of my references here are from non-Muslim sources in order to keep myself as objective as possible. Okay. So enumerating the cause of the downfall of the Mughal Empire, this is Vidya Dhar Mahajan, who is a Hindu. He writes, too much wealth, luxury, and leisure softened their characters. Their harems became full. They got wine in plenty. They went in palanquins to the battlefield. Such nobles were not fit to fight against the Marathas, the Rajputs, and the Sikhs. The nobility degenerated at a very rapid pace. As for religion, it was a decade, as decadent as everything else. Uh, the austere monotheism of Prophet Muhammad had become overlaid with a rank growth of superstitions and puerile mysticism. The mosques stood unfrequented and ruinous, deserted by the ignorant multitude, which decked out in amulets, charms, and rosaries, listened to squalid fakirs or ecstatic dervishes, and went on pilgrimage to the tomb of a holy man, worshipped saints as intercessors with Allah, who had become too remote a being for the direct devotion of these benighted souls, basically saying that Muslims were committing shirk. They were committing shirk. They were praying, maybe, if they were good enough to pray. They were praying, but as he says... Most masajids were going empty. People were spending more time in mazars, mausoleums, where people were buried, buzurgs were buried, right? Elders were buried. And they would go there, and they would worship there, and they would do sajda there. And I can tell you from personal experience what I saw when I went to Khaja Bati Billah grave in Delhi. This is 1997 when I went uh, when I was studying in India. I remember when I went... Um, so I was at Delhi station, I had three hours left for to catch the train, so I had free time. So I came out, I said, listen, is there anything like here that I could see, like some historical monument or something? So somebody told me, yeah, Khaja Baki Billah's grave is like literally walking distance. So I walked and well, I was actually more than walking distance, it was about a mile. Um, so I kept on walking, 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 asking as I went along, finally got there. And here's a big grave, a cemetery, massive cemetery, I reached the cemetery. And there's like a gazebo, but this gazebo is like decked out in flowers and all sorts of um, streamers and flags, red, blue, poor, orange. And then what I noticed the most was a long line of people. So in the middle of the gazebo was the actual grave. And then there's a long line of people, like literally very long very long and in that line of people what i found most interesting is that there weren't only muslims even though khaja baqi billah himself was a muslim and he was a muwahid he was the sheikh of mujaddad al-fithani the second mujaddad of this millennium right i'm sorry not second mujaddad the mujaddad of the second millennium he was his sheikh extreme muwahid but here his grave had become a place of shirk. But what I'm saying was that, what I found was that most of the people there were not even Muslim. There was Hindus, there were Sikh, there were Buddhists, okay? And a few Muslims as well. And they were all together. It was like a synthesis of different religions and people from different backgrounds all coming together. And they were very happy. Like, I mean, nobody seemed to feel the difference that, you know, I'm Hindu and you're Muslim or I'm Muslim and you're Buddhist. We're just all one big family, it seemed like. All there for the same reason. Okay. 
to go and worship the grave. And so they would go, there was a green box, they would put their money in there, and then they would go down into such stuff. Muslims did it. I saw people with beards, Muslims with beards. I saw all sorts of different people. And so that was a situation then. It still is the situation now. But at least now, we have people who understand that this is wrong, who condemn it. Okay? Not thousands, not hundreds, millions of people who recognize it for what it is. Okay? So, as for the moral precepts of the Quran, they were ignored or defined. Um, wine drinking, opium eating were good universal i don't know what he means by that it's a little bit of maybe of a typo in the book but that's how i just typed it up as i as it was in the book prostitution was rampant and most of the, and the most degrading vices were flaunted naked and i can't see what's written underneath there but and unashamed okay so there you have the situation of the mughal emperors and the general situation of the society at large at the time of Shawi Okay. So I think we can end it here, inshallah, and we will continue this, inshallah. Next, inshallah. Okay, let's just go through this very quickly. So here are the four major challenges that Shawli Allah faced that he needed to overcome in order for the deen to be preserved and to be protected and to be saved from dissolution in the Indian subcontinent. So number one was that the society was pantheist. Okay. What is pantheist? We'll talk about that in detail. This is by far, I put this at number one. This was the most dangerous element that Shawli Allah had to remove in order for him to be able to start up uh, a, his mission, for him to be able to be successful. He knew he had to destroy that first thing, the pantheist society. He couldn't do it all the way because it's impossible. Otherwise, India wouldn't be India anymore. Just give me one second, please. Second thing was the Mughal Empire. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, the Mughal Empire was not an Islamic empire in any shape or form. It started with, um, who was the first uh, Mughal Empire? It was Babur, and then after him was Hamayyo, and Hamayyo's son was Akbar. Um, most people say, the first Mughal emperor was Babur, but in reality, the first Muslim Mughal emperor was Akbar. And the reason is, is that Babur entered into the Indian subcontinent. He established, he wasn't, but he, but he wasn't able to establish the Mughal emperor. Empire, sorry, the Mughal empire. He wasn't able to establish it. What Akbar did was, he was able to establish and bring the roots of the Mughal Empire so deep into Indian soil, so deep into Indian soil, that we still see the effects of it to this day. Okay, How he was able to do it, the man was a total genius. He was brilliant as a politician, but how he did it, he destroyed his old dean in the process, and he destroyed the Indian subcontinent in the process in order to consolidate his own power and to establish himself as a supreme emperor. And he did not die a Muslim, by the way. He died a Catholic. Influence of Persian culture. So we've gone from number one, number two. The influence of Persian culture, we'll talk about that, inshallah, in more detail in the next week. And then, inshallah, hopefully, the Sheikh of Burhan Institute will give me a third session if they do, that would be very nice of them. I would definitely appreciate it. But if they don't, <coughs> then I may have to bribe them to give me a little more time. 
Otherwise, we're going to have to cut it short. But either way, inshallah, I'm sure you've benefited from this session. You'll benefit from the next session. And if we don't get the third session, at least you had these two sessions to benefit from, inshallah. Uh, so we'll wrap it up here until next week. Please, all of you, remember me in your du'as. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.